Okay, so I want to show you a kind of, not a full derivation of the moment of inertia, but it, it kind of helps you understand what's going on with the moment of inertia. And I'm going to look at this in terms of the kinetic energy and the angular momentum. Uh, oh, and then I guess you need to know momentum is mass times velocity also. Okay, so suppose I have this system, and it had just, this is not a mass, it's a pivot point. It's got mass m1, a distance r1 from that, and mass m2, a distance r2 away, and then it rotates, so it's a rigid object. These these are staying with relative to each other, and they're just two masses. Uh, so if I want to find the kinetic energy, I could say the kinetic energy of the system is going to be one half m1 v1 squared plus one half m2 v2 squared. So that is something that I know is true. Uh, so I can, in this case, this one is moving in a circle, and this one's moving in a smaller circle. So they have different speeds, right? They're, it's a rigid object, but since this is rotating with an angular velocity omega, then this mass is actually going faster. Uh, so if you imagine this to be like a full circle uh, and how long it takes to get around there, you can see that the distance around is 2 pi r, and based on the time it takes from the angular velocity, which is in radians per second, then I get this. V, the magnitude of the velocity, is r times omega. So that's the velocity in terms of omega and the distance from the center of the circle. Uh, so if I put that in up here, the one thing that's nice is that mass 1 has a velocity, mass 2 has a different velocity, but they have the same angular velocity because it's a rigid object. So if I rewrite kinetic energy, I can say this is equal to 1 half m1. Now for, uh, for this, v1 is going to be r1 omega. So this is going to be r1 squared omega squared. And then for mass 2, I have plus 1 half m2 r2 squared omega squared. And that's the same omega. So I can factor out the omega and the 1 half, and I get 1 half m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared times omega squared. Now imagine that I have even more, even more, um, masses in here. I could have as many as I want. As long as I know their radius and their mass, I can find their component m1 r1 squared and just add them up. So I'm going to call this i, the moment of inertia. And we could write that as the sum over i of m i r i squared. That's the moment of inertia. So now if I have a rigid object like, a, like this, like a stick, and I spin it, uh, I can find that moment of inertia, which I'll do in another video. Uh, and, and then use that to find the kinetic energy, where the kinetic energy is one-half I omega squared. Cool? Um, oh, so a really important point. This is the scalar definition of the moment of inertia. This assumes that there's a fixed axis of rotation, so there's a, a stick right here, and it can only rotate around that axis. If you let it have a free rotation where it can rotate in any way, that's not true anymore. So this is just an approximation. Okay. Now what about the moment of inertia? Let's take the same thing uh, and the angular momentum, and let's see if I can do this with the angular momentum. So angular momentum is defined as the vector r cross p. So if this is rotating this way, the angular momentum vector would be into the paper, like that. So, but I have the angular momentum of this, because it has an r, and this has a p, r and a p, so I get uh, L equals r1 cross, I'll call that m1 v1, plus r2 cross m2 v2. Now the, the mass is a constant, so I can factor that out over here, and I get this is equal to m1 times r1 cross v1 plus m2 times r2 cross v2. Now here I can use the following uh, relationship. I know that the angular velocity vector is defined as r cross v over r squared. I know that's a stretch, I didn't derive that, uh, but you can imagine, it. first of all, it has the right units of velocity, of radians per second, because the, these cancel and the meters cancel. And it does give the right units, right? Because if this is, uh, this is, has a velocity that way, so there's r, r cross v is in the right direction into the, into the paper. 
So if that's true, then I can write this. I can write r cross v as r squared omega. So, and again, we have the same angular velocity. So I have m1. Now instead of r1 v1, I get r1 squared omega vector plus m2 r2 squared omega. Uh, and then I can factor that out and I get uh, m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared omega equals i omega. Using the same definition of the moment of inertia, I can instead of looking at this as individual point objects and calculating the angular momentum due to a point, I can say the angular momentum is i omega. And again, this only works, actually kind of works, but it only works where i is a scalar if the axis is fixed. If you have free uh, rotations, then i is actually a tensor. So it makes it a little more complicated. But for here, assume the axis is fixed, and then that's how you get the moment of inertia uh, derived from the kinetic energy and the angular momentum. So I'm going to go ahead and do start doing some of these problems. I'm going to do uh, a, a stick rotated about it, and then I'll do a disc, a ring, and some other things. So I'll, I'll do that right now in another video. So don't wait. So I'm ending this video now. You're still here. Okay, I'm really ending it now. Here we go.